Hello, um, Ian and Diane Haggerty here. Um, we farm in the Wheat Belt region of Western Australia. The farm comprises of 18,000 hectares of a um, cereal cropping operation integrated with livestock, holistic, holistically run livestock, um, mainly all sheep. In 2001 we did some work with Elaine Ingham at one of her workshops and she talked about the microbiology and the impacts that has under the soil and that was just a really great opportunity for us to start understanding how we could use those natural processes. Elaine was talking about the microbes, how they could nutrient cycle, how they could rebuild soil structure to hold water, retain water in the landscape and we thought well that's probably what we're needing to do. So we put a real strong focus from then on on trying to support the biology and then over time we've been able to develop ways that's really stimulated the natural biology. The biggest challenge has probably been the drop off in rainfall since the 90s. The rainfall dropped by about 30 percent on average per annum and just become more erratic when the rain fell. I mean we might have 150 mil rainfall for the year fairly regularly you want plants that are adapted to this environment so we've been really focusing on trying to encourage the, the native plants to return because they're the ones that don't cost you the money to seed they're, and they're adapted to this environment. It's a very brittle environment, there's no doubt about that and we were meant to be about a 13 inch rainfall um, area and we're on average now about an 8 inch rainfall area and we could just see that things weren't working, you know, you're putting these artificial inputs in, you know, you put in NPK every year and and, and, and calcium and you always had calcium deficiencies you know you always had phosphorus deficiencies you always had zinc deficiencies um, and no matter how much we did or what we did that would never balance up so we could just see that this system wasn't working and it was getting expensive and our, our terms of trade with what we were getting for our product and the quality of our product was decreasing and the risk margin was getting too great and it was a a, a system where it was just a moron system. You know, it was just every time something wasn't quite right, it was just put more on, which was just more cost. And I could just see it, it didn't have the legs to go forward. And you saw country degradation. You know, we saw, we saw more salinity coming in, uh, more acidity, and um, those season variances that came in were hitting us harder because we didn't have a, a root system and a carbon base being built to iron those things out. Coming to this land here up at Moran where it probably, well some of it would have only got cleared in the 80s wouldn't That's it? Right. So it's probably hasn't been into an agricultural system quite as long and it's been able to respond really rapidly. We found even within only just one or two years of using the crop as a tool because we put the worm liquid and the compost extract down as a liquid with the seed it really changes the soil ecology where that crop grows so we've been able to use the crop roots to really start facilitating that soil change. The native grasses then come up directly where the air cedar had been so it's obviously changed it enough for those plants to get the signals to think that's a, a good environment for them to come back again so without planting them or bringing those seeds back they've just been dormant in the soil when the right situation presented itself, right conditions, away they went. What's really been amazing to us is once you stimulate that quorum of activity under the soil and you put that stimulation in there um, which would lead to quorum sensing, what actually does come and you think after all these years you know how can it still be there and they just pop up. In, in building this operation we've we farmed over 50 different farms, pieces of country around the place. We've farmed from gutless white beach sands, you know, to acidic country, to heavy red country, um, to higher rainfall down south, um, to this low brittle rainfall here. So it just goes to show that biology, once you get it right, once you get those animals right, it, it works anywhere. It's really interesting what Ian just mentioned then, like some of the farms that had virtually like white beach sand type soil types and you do a soil analysis and they say oh well you're going to have to put bucket loads of nitrogen and potassium in particular on those um, paddocks to grow a crop and you go okay yeah, fair enough um, and wouldn't do that and just use the same old biological processes and the nitrogen and potassium levels were always adequate or and even um, over adequate. I remember looking at the K levels in those on those properties in those sands and that was zilch. There was no trace at all and all the all the current advice of the time, you, you don't add K, you're not going to grow a crop. And we took some of that country and um, 
it was on a development block there and we, we, we cropped it a lot over about a 10 year period and we never added K and the whole time through K levels were adequate in all the plants and they just stabilised and Elaine said back in the early 90s she says you know you can get caught up in why there's no K there and how you're going to get it and, and why all these interactions are working and you can waste a lot of time getting caught up in those little nitty gritty details but he says the most important thing is to learn the process you know the process that you've got to put in place to actually get that result our knowledge of what's actually going on underneath the soil and even interaction with microbes in the atmosphere and things we really have a very limited knowledge on what truly is going on and probably going to never really fully understand it and don't really need to but just be excited by the fact that these things can happen. That's the whole thing with natural based systems that nature can do a far better job than putting anything on it ultimately um, but it's just a matter of a process of getting the soil back into that state um, and, and remembering that we are disturbing it you know by growing crops and things like that um, and running livestock so all those things have to be taken into account. And as Diane said about the native perennials coming back in and the natural system coming back in that's what we're finding is working best. We're a large area, brittle environment and to do massive amounts of cover cropping to cover that kind of area ends up a very costly operation. Use a lot of fuel, big carbon footprint doing it, we're out a lot of machinery doing that. But what we're finding now by sensing that quorum, we get any rain from now on and those summer active natives, will, will they'll just be there, they'll just come. So they'll be coming up through the crop and on a lot of the pasture country, they're coming up for nothing. You know, we don't have to do a thing, so by the time we turn those headers off, if we get the rain, that green feed base is there. Unfortunately, we spend most of our time working on the farm, but that marketing of the produce, being able to segregate it for the consumer and label it for the consumer so that they understand what it is, is a really important thing because you know, that's one of our passions, is to try and get the best possible quality produce, both nutritionally and microbially, to the consumer, but they've, they've got to know about it. And so if we put it in the traditional system, it all gets bunched up with everything and we can't segregate that. So it is something we're, we're working on because I think yeah, the consumer ultimately needs those choices that they can access. I think that's where some of Zach Bush's work is just so exciting because he's illuminating that for the consumer to say, well, listen, I can really drive the choices and we've got to seek that out in our community, whether it be through you know, um, artisan butchers or bakers or whatever it might be. The customer's not the problem. You go and give the customer the option and that they are not the problem at all. You know, they, they want this kind of agriculture and especially the new generation of consumers, they want the food experience, they want to know the story, they want to know where their food come from, came from and the ecological footprint that their food's coming with and the, and the story behind that food. The farmer will soon mould to actually produce that, but it's the whole system in the middle of actually getting it to market and getting it labelled and getting it there in, in scale. Like when you want to do thousands of tonnes, like a, a property of this size, there's a lot of cost and a lot of logistics involved to do that. And then when you want to open it up to other farmers, we've got to get a whole supply chain in place to do that, which we're working on. The produce has to be respected. We've got to be very careful that we don't take this new wave of regenerative agriculture and dumb it down and commoditise it and put a very small premium on it because um, then you'll only get a small part of a result that's required in the ecosystem service. We've got chemical residues in, in food all around the world and you know we, we test a lot of our produce or nearly all of our produce and we're coming up with zero chemical residues at all and especially coming onto degraded farms you know that have, have had heavy chemical use and we're finding the microbial integrity between the animals and the inputs that we put into it um, we're detoxifying those chemical residues very quickly in one year. It's just been amazing, you know, that we, we pick the proteins up that we do and we put zero nitrogen on. We've got to take ourselves back, a step back as humans, thinking that we're dictating the situation where we're not. You know, nature has been in place for billions of years and worked out a beautiful system of evolution of, um, and succession and so forth. We've just got to take our, a bit of our arrogance out of the way and think that we know better, which clearly I, I don't think we do, but perhaps some other people will argue with that quite strongly. But um, what we've seen certainly has challenged all the understanding we had previously.
If we think we're going to dominate nature, we've got another thing coming. <laughs> It'll have the winning hand all the way through, and I think we're seeing that all around the world. So the faster we wake up to that, we've actually got to work with her and against her, is, um, the better off we'll be. And we drew that line in the sand a long time ago and decided to work with it and against it in every way that we could and it's paid great dividends for us. And that's probably the point that Guy and I try to prove. You, you can do it over massive scale and you can use all the technologies, but totally integrating it with this basic natural system. And once the people start to get a taste of true quality food that has that taste about it, you know, the, the human system is, is a very intelligent being and it, it knows, it, it's dumbed down at the moment, you know, we're just eating large amounts of gut fill to get the nutrition that we need. But once, once you get a taste for what's right, you go hunting it. It's your, it's your natural instinct, you'll go looking for it. You won't want to eat that crap anymore. And we're in a generation at the moment that's been brought up on crap. And um, we've, got, we've got to take responsibility as producers, as the commodity movers, the middlemen in the middle, um, to actually say, no, this product is available. Put it out there, you know? And it might be a bit slow to start off with, but take the line and put it out there. Because I know in the long run, that's what'll come out on top. In 2001 was Elaine Ingham and Dr Arden Anderson when we went to a four day workshop with them which was fantastic and at the same time Jane Slattery from South Australia with the Free Choice Mineral Systems um, and Animal Intuition. That's been a, a massive learning curve for us and um, animals capacity within landscape healing. Along the line then would be I think there was Jerry Brunetti and then Dr Christine Jones was a real illuminator for us with the liquid carbon pathway because that was how we were able to finally understand the carbon we were able to get into the soils here because we weren't having that labile carbon mulching effect from the surface as you can see out here in these really dry brittle environments building a, a layer on top gets pretty challenging when you've only got 150 mil rainfall throughout the year so yeah when Dr Christine Jones presented that concept to us we really understood a heck of a lot more from there um, we met Walter Yenna probably a few years after that and he gave us a really good understanding of the Australian microbiology and changes in plant succession and so forth and helped us understand a lot more about rock microbes and fungi and their activity. Nicole Masters, Nicole's mm. been great in her guidance along the way and um, bringing other systems um, that's been happening around the world and her yeah. whole knowledge on and driving the system forward. Charlie Massey's been great. He's been a great inspiration of um, the paradigm change and looking into why people think and why they change and bringing those those um, case those examples um, to a to a wider audience. Of his book. Charlie was the one that sort of highlighted us to um, the field of epigenetics. I hadn't ever heard of it before, and I think we met Charlie. Well, Charlie came over in 2010 and I was just describing to him what we'd seen with the animals and um, the self-replacing livestock and what was going on with the integration with the landscape and he said well I basically was describing epigenetics so then that opened a whole new world to us there as well of looking and understanding of those processes and how they might impact on human health and, and, and the health of your landscape as well. Yeah, I think the combination of people like Nicole and Christine and everyone who goes all over the world and uh, you know, to, to ring through and bring those examples that are happening around the world and you can, you can cross, correlate and, and, and share information which is really great. Probably another big help's really been is um, the Soils for Life, Soils for Life thing, we're, on, we're part of that and um, our national soil advocate, Major Michael Jeffries, Major General Michael Jeffries has been a tireless worker and, and his team and have, have been a great help the Australian farming scene and, and, and pushing this forward in the right channels that need to be pushed forward so they need to be supported a lot. You know, these these um, bodies need to be supported a lot along the way.